All right, we are in 2 Kings chapters 18 through 20 tonight. Again, we may not make it through all three of those chapters, but I'm going to do my best to move in kind of an expeditious fashion through this material. We've come to the reign of Hezekiah in the southern kingdom. Hezekiah, significant for a number of reasons. One is that he is a bridge character. A bridge character are those Bible characters that bridge major periods of Bible history. And so we saw last week in 2 Kings 17 the destruction of the northern kingdom of Israel at the hands of the Assyrian Empire. That happens in 721 or 722 B.C. during the reign and administration of King Hezekiah, who was reigning over the southern kingdom of Judah at that time. So Hezekiah bridges these two periods. His reign begins during the period of the divided kingdom, and it extends into what we call Judah alone, or the period of the surviving kingdom. Another reason that Hezekiah is important is that he is unarguably one of the greatest kings that ever reigned over the people of God. Uh, in fact, there is a statement in our text this evening that might suggest he was the most righteous king that the people of God ever had reign over them, uh, excepting only perhaps David, although we'll see that Josiah is also significant there. Another reason that Hezekiah is really important is that more material in the canon is devoted to him than any of the other kings of this period. We have more text devoted to the life and administration of Hezekiah than any other king in the divided kingdom. And I want you to jot this down because we will have reference to some of these passages tonight. Besides our primary text, which is 2 Kings 18 through 20, we also have 2 Chronicles chapters 29 to 32. So four chapters in Chronicles, 29 to 32, as well as four chapters in the book of Isaiah. And if you're familiar with the book of Isaiah, you'll know that there is a section of prophecy and then a historical bridge and then a second section of prophecy. That historical bridge is Isaiah chapters 36 to 39, and it is entirely about the reign and life of Hezekiah. And these three sections are complementary. They are uh, uh, kind of a harmony, or not a harmony, I guess, but, but need to be placed in harmony. They are parallel texts uh, for some of the same events. So you have a tremendous amount of literature uh, that is devoted in Scripture, in the Old Testament, to Hezekiah's life and to his administration. Eleven chapters of the Old Testament tells that story. So Hezekiah is a great king, maybe the greatest king, and tonight we're going to try and survey uh, his life, as, at least as much of it as we can. Now, I am going to primarily focus on the account in Kings but there are going to be a couple of places where we're going to make reference to Chronicles and Isaiah. So you'll want to perhaps have your finger in Kings so that you can flip back and forth uh, easily. Let me begin by reading the first 12 verses of 2 Kings chapter 18. In the third year of Hoshea son of Elah, king of Israel, Hezekiah the son of Ahaz, king of Judah, began to reign. He was 25 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 29 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Abi, the daughter of Zechariah. And he did what was right in the eyes of Yahweh, according to all that, his, that David his father had done. He removed the high places, and broke the pillars, and cut down the Asherah. And he broke in pieces the bronze serpent that Moses had made. For until those days the people of Israel had made offerings to it. It was called Nehushtan. He trusted in Yahweh, the God of Israel, so that there was none like him among all the kings of Judah after him, nor among those who were before him. For he held fast to Yahweh. He did not depart from following him, but kept the commandments that Yahweh commanded Moses. And Yahweh was with him. Wherever he went out, he prospered. He rebelled against the king of Assyria and would not serve him. He struck down the Philistines as far as Gaza and its territory from watchtower to fortified city. In the fourth year of King Hezekiah, which was the seventh year of Hoshea, son of Elah, king of Israel, Shalmaneser, king of Assyria, came up against Samaria and besieged it. And at the end of three years, he took it. In the sixth year of Hezekiah, which was the ninth year of Hoshea, king of Israel, Samaria was taken. The king of Assyria carried the Israelites away to Assyria and put them in Hala and on the Habor, the river of Gozan, and in the cities of the Medes, because they did not obey the voice of Yahweh their God, but transgressed his covenant, even all that Moses the servant of Yahweh commanded. They neither listened nor obeyed. 
Now you can see in those first two paragraphs the contrast between Hezekiah's faithfulness, which is extraordinary. There is effusive praise given to his administration in those first several verses in contrast to the faithlessness of the northern kingdom of Israel. And so you have this kind of recapitulation, this representation of the history of uh, the Assyrian destruction of the northern kingdom. You say, we just read this a few verses ago, but I think the writer repeats it here in order to make you aware of the fact that this is the very period when Hezekiah is being faithful. It's not as though Hezekiah is in easy circumstances. It's not as though there is widespread revival of Yahweh worship across the ancient Near East. It's at the very time that the Assyrians are mowing down the northern kingdom of Israel, threatening Judah, threatening other ancient Near Eastern nations. It's the very time that God is pouring out wrath upon the, the Israelites of the northern tribes that Hezekiah is seeking the Lord and he is going to war against idolatry. So Yahweh is bringing judgment against the idolatry of the northern kingdom at the same time that Hezekiah, as the representative king, the covenant king of Judah, he's bringing war against the idols of the southern kingdom. Now there's some question about the chronology here. All of these uh, chronological questions we said several weeks ago have, I think, been ably answered and worked out by conservative scholars. And if you're curious about that, just ask me. I can recommend some resources. But his reign is 29 years. There's a, there's a question about a co-regency that may be coextensive, uh, not coextensive, but, but rather uh, uh, run concurrently with the first uh, several years of his reign, or it may need to be tacked on to that 29 years. But, but he reigns for 29 years, the text says, and during that reign, he has a remarkable influence upon the history of this nation. Now, we said that Hezekiah is arguably the greatest or one of the greatest kings that ever rules over the people of God. It's not really a contest, but you see there in verses 5 and 6, he trusted in Yahweh so that there was none like him among all the kings of Judah after him nor those who were before him. And so you say, how far back does that go? Is it, is it saying that he's even more faithful than David? Well, no, not necessarily. It seems to have reference to the divided kingdom, to the kings of Judah. He is following in the footsteps of his father David. But one of the reasons that this question comes up is if you turn over just a few pages to chapter 23, in chapter 23, the other contender, as it were, for this title of most faithful king would certainly be Josiah. And of Josiah, it says in verse 25 of 2 Kings 23, Before him there was no king like him who turned to Yahweh with all his heart and with all his soul and with all his might, according to all the law of Mo Moses, nor did any like him arise after him. Now you may look at those two passages and say, aren't they in contradiction? Because you can't say of Hezekiah, there was none like him or after him, not neither before him nor after him. And you can't say the same thing just a, a, a couple of kings later of Josiah, there was none like him before him or after him. Uh, I mean, one of them's got to be better than the other. Well, well, first of all, the biblical text is not intending to create a contest, uh, a contest of comparison to say, well, Hezekiah, he just barely edged out Josiah or vice versa. But one of the things that is important to notice is the difference with regard to what is being referenced. So in chapter 18, Hezekiah is said to be unique in his trust in Yahweh. His trust in Yahweh and clinging to Yahweh throughout his life. Whereas in chapter 23, Josiah is said to be unique in his repentance toward Yahweh. And we'll see this when we come to Josiah's reign, that he comes to the throne at a time where Judah is not worshiping the Lord, and Josiah initially is not seeking the Lord. And yet, after several years, as a very young man, he begins to seek the Lord, and then he begins to renovate the temple, and the book of the law is found, and he says, we've got to initiate national repentance, national reformation. And there was no one like him who had ever done something like that before or after, at least on the scale that he did. So that seems to be the particular reference here. Uh, Hezekiah, like Josiah, is preceded by a very wicked king. Hezekiah's father, Ahaz, an exceedingly wicked king. So it's not as though he comes into a religious environment, and yet from day one, perhaps because Hezekiah is already an adult when he comes to the throne, and Josiah is not. But from day one of his administration, it is all Yahweh. It is all a covenantal administration, and that was not the case in Josiah's experience, and so I think that explains the difference there. Hezekiah holds fast, whereas Josiah has to turn to. 
Now, we've seen other kings that the, the, the writer here, the historian, says served Yahweh, but not like David. And we've seen several kings like that, that, that they would say they were, they were a good king, but not quite like David. But Hezekiah is said specifically to serve God like David and to keep the commandments that Yahweh gave through Moses. And that's a remarkable description, and it certainly stands in contrast to the mo most of the rest of the kings. Uh, during these 29 years, he promotes repentance, reformation, and restoration in Judah. And Chronicles provides an extensive description of this. If we were going to actually survey the reformation of Hezekiah, we would have to devote an entire class period just to looking at that uh, in the book of 2 Chronicles. I want you to turn over to 2 Chronicles and just look with me at the summary statement. So it's in 2 Chronicles chapter 31 and verse 21. 2 Chronicles 31 and verse 21. It's been describing for several chapters the reformation efforts of Hezekiah, the way that he uh, restores the temple, restores the priesthood, restores worship, and restores the Passover. And one of the remarkable things Hezekiah does is he, he reinstigates the Passover. It had been neglected for no telling how many years, many, many years. He says, we're going to have the Passover. We're serious about keeping the law. We're going to follow the Jewish calendar that we're supposed to be following. And by this time, the northern tribes have been destroyed. But the Assyrians, having carried away most of the inhabitants of the north, have left the poor and various other people. This is one of the things we did not discuss last week, but one of the reasons that the Jews in Jesus' day hated the Samaritans was not just that they followed a bastardized form of religion, but because they were half-breeds. By the time of Jesus, the people of the northern tribes that had remained behind had intermarried with all of those pagans that we read about, and so they're kind of sort of Jews, not exactly. And that's one of the reasons for this incredible hostility and antipathy between the Samaritans and, and the Jews. So in Hezekiah's time, that intermarriage hasn't occurred yet. In fact, the repopulation probably hasn't even fully taken place. And so there are still stragglers. There are kind of exiles in their own land, uh, people from the northern tribes. And Hezekiah sends messengers to them and says, come to Jerusalem and participate in the Passover with us. I mean, that's, that's what kind of a king this is. Hezekiah is a great, godly man. And in 2 Chronicles 31 and verse 21, it says, Every work that he undertook in the service of the house of God and in accordance with the law and the commandments, seeking his God, he did with all his heart and prospered. And just recently, we looked at a king that was said to serve the Lord, but not with a whole heart. Not with a perfect heart, but just the opposite is true of Hezekiah. Everything that he did, everything that he did with regard to the temple, the priesthood, the worship, the Passover, the law, the commandments, everything that he did with regard to his relationship with God, he did with all of his heart. And therefore, he prospered. So I'll leave it to you to go and read those chapters of Chronicles and to see kind of the elaboration. Uh, that reformation is incredible. It's a worthwhile study uh, in itself, uh, but we're just not going to take the time to do it in, in this particular survey since our focus is on kings. One of the things, coming back now to 2 Kings 18, one of the things that is said by way of commendation about Hezekiah is that he rebelled against the king of Assyria. This is verse 7. The Lord was with him. Wherever he went out, he prospered. He rebelled against the king of Assyria and would not serve him. Now, we're going to see that Assyria is the primary foe that Hezekiah faces during his administration. And yet, this is a good thing, that he is not willing to submit. He makes a, 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 a decision, a, a, a commitment here as a matter of religious conviction. I will not yield to the Assyrians. And that has some very dramatic consequences. Politically, uh, economically, militarily, financially. There, there are a number of consequences. They're quite unpleasant, by the way, uh, in, in making this decision. You might imagine, well, but if he makes a good decision, if he makes a faithful decision, then God's always going to bless that. That's always going to work out. Not, not so fast, right? Uh, eventually, God will bless it. Eventually, God will work it out. But there may be years of pain and struggle and hardship and sacrifice that stand between that righteous decision and the favorable outcome that one would desire. 
Uh, during Hezekiah's reign, popular opinion was still divided with regard to the question of political alliances and foreign policy. And this is primarily comes out in uh, the book of Isaiah. And if you want to just jot this down, I'm not going to take the time to read it, but Isaiah chapter 30, verses 1 through 5, and chapter 31, verses 1 through 5, Isaiah addresses this problem that presumably during Hezekiah's reign is still ongoing. Uh, some of the Israelites, or the, the Judeans uh, more properly, uh, some of them are wanting to rely on Egypt against Assyria. Some of them are wanting to ally themselves with Assyria uh, and, and simply go along with kind of the, the trend of world politics at the, t at the time. Hezekiah's decision to reject both of these solutions had to be unpopular. I mean, Hezekiah basically says, no, we're going to cut that baby in half, right? N nobody's going to be happy with this. Nobody is going to like his policies. And can you imagine the context publicly, popularly, of these religious reforms? I mean, Ahaz, Hezekiah's father, as we said, was a very wicked king. He sacrifices his own son. The, I mean, there's a fascinating possibility here that Hezekiah is not the original crown prince. Now, I don't know whether Ahaz would actually sacrifice the heir or whether he would sacrifice some other son who was not in line to inherit the throne, but it's at least possible that in God's providence, that wicked, vile act by Ahaz is used by the Lord to put Hezekiah on the throne, right? It's an interesting possibility. But, but regardless, you cannot imagine that the nation is just chomping at the bit for revival at this point. Now, and, and, and I don't want you to misunderstand here. You may be thinking, oh, but if, but if Ahaz was an exceedingly wicked king, then, then surely they would want a righteous king. Well, maybe some did. Certainly the remnant did. Maybe even popularly some of them thought, well, it would be good to have a little less idolatry and child sacrifice and a little more Yahweh worship. But look at the extent to which Hezekiah takes that. Look at the extensiveness of the reformations that are described in Chronicles. You cannot imagine that most of the nation was really eager about that. I mean, can you imagine uh, a, a government coming to power here that suddenly starts to say, you know what, we're going to roll everything back for the last 50 years, for the last 80 years. All of the progress of sexual immorality, of perversity, of just godless uh, policies and programs, and we're just going to roll all of that back. Now, there'd be some people in the nation that say, praise God, hallelujah, our prayers have been answered. I think there'd be a lot of people that say, I didn't sign up for this, this is not what I want, this is not what I voted for, right? Hezekiah is swimming against the current in all of these things, and yet, and yet, God blesses him, God is with him. And that's the first application I want you to see in these 12 verses, is that obedience to God is the path of blessing and advantage. Hezekiah did not succeed because he was a good politician. He had success because he served God. The right decision about Assyria, about public religion, about administration did not depend on polling data or popular opinion. Leaders have to do what is right, not what is popular, and not what is merely politically advantageous. Sometimes leadership, good leadership, true leadership, actually means making a decision that is politically disadvantageous, and rebelling against Assyria was definitely that for Hezekiah, at least in the short term, as we said. We just don't know how hard this, uh, this policy and program of reform would have been for Hezekiah, but the point is he persevered in it because it was right. And we have to believe that God's way will work out in the end, that we have to choose it because it is right, even when it is hard, even if it is unpopular, even if it doesn't always work out in our favor in the short term. One of the things that my boys and I talk about when we will be reading a book or we'll be um, maybe watching a video or hearing a news story about someone who gave their life, you know, a uh, reading a story to them the other day about a, a boy protecting his sister from a, a, an attacker, and the boy died, and the sister survived. And we always say the same thing about those kind of stories. We say, that's a good way to die. Everybody's got to die sometime. Everybody's got to die some way. Well, we want to die well. That's a good way to die, right? And, and, and this, is, this is going to be your attitude, that you don't make decisions based upon whether you're going to survive. You don't make decisions based upon whether it's going to be to your advantage in the short term. You've got to make decisions based upon what's right. And even if that means you lose your life, even if that means you lose 
your, your friends, your family, your job, your home. You've got to be willing to choose what's right and trust God for the future. And that's what we see in Hezekiah uh, at the very outset of his ministry. Now, uh, his ministry, his administration, right? Um, I think that the first uh, eight verses of chapter 18 are intended to be a snapshot of the whole. And as we go through the rest of this material, you're going to see that saying that Hezekiah was an exceedingly righteous man doesn't mean he was a sinless man. Doesn't mean that he was a perfect man. He's, far, he's not. He's far from it. And yet, I want you to remember, this is the summary. This is God's assessment of Hezekiah. Uh, God does not judge Hezekiah on the basis of his sins or his poor judgments or his mistakes. He doesn't judge Hezekiah moment to moment and say, I love you, I love you not. I love you, I love you not. You know, right? That, that's not how a relationship with God works. He sees Hezekiah as a righteous man ultimately because of the righteousness of Christ. And he sees that Hezekiah is a man who by grace, by the help of the Spirit, is committed to covenantal obedience. There is a pattern of faithfulness. It's not perfect. It's not perfectly consistent. But it's a pattern. And praise God for it. In verse 13, picking up. In the 14th year of King Hezekiah, Sennacherib, king of Assyria, came up against all the fortified cities of Judah and took them. And Hezekiah, king of Judah, sent to the king of Assyria at Lachish, saying, I have done wrong. Withdraw from me. Whatever you impose on me, I will bear. And the king of Assyria required of Hezekiah, king of Judah, 300 talents of silver and 30 talents of gold. And Hezekiah gave him all the silver that was found in the house of Yahweh and in the treasuries of the king's house. At that time, Hezekiah stripped the gold from the doors of the temple of Yahweh and from the doorpost that Hezekiah, king of Judah, had overlaid and gave it to the king of Assyria. And the king of Assyria sent the Tartan, the Rabsaris, and the Rabshakeh with a great army from Lachish to King Hezekiah at Jerusalem. And they went up and came to Jerusalem. When they arrived, they came and stood by the conduit of the upper pool, which is on the highway to the washer's field. And when they called for the king, there came out to them Eliakim, the son of Hilkiah, who was over the household, and Shebna, the secretary, and Joah, the son of Asaph, the recorder. And the Rabshakeh said to them, Say to Hezekiah, Thus says the great king, the king of Assyria, On what do you rest this trust of yours? Do you think that mere words are strategy and power for war? In whom do you now trust that you have rebelled against me? Behold, you are trusting now in Egypt, that broken reed of a staff, which will pierce the hand of any man who leans on it. Such is Pharaoh, king of Egypt, to all who trust in him. But if you say to me, We trust in Yahweh our God, is it not he whose high places and altars Hezekiah has removed, saying to Judah and to Jerusalem, You shall worship before this altar in Jerusalem? Come now, make a wager with my master, the king of Assyria. I will give you 2,000 horses if you are able on your part to set riders on them. How then can you repulse a single captain among the least of my master's servants when you trust in Egypt for horse chariots and for horsemen? Moreover, is it without Yahweh that I have come up against this place to destroy it? Yahweh said to me, go up against this land and destroy it. Then Eliakim, the son of Hilkiah, and Shebna and Joah said to the Rabshakeh, Please speak to your servants in Aramaic, for we understand it. Do not speak to us in the language of Judah within the hearing of the people who are on the wall. But the Rabshakeh said to them, has my master sent me to speak these words to your master and to you, and not to the men sitting on the wall who are doomed with you to eat their own dung and drink their own urine? Then the Rabshakeh stood and called out in a loud voice in the language of Judah, Hear the word of the great king, the king of Assyria. Thus says the king, Do not let Hezekiah deceive you, for he will not be able to deliver you out of my hand. Do not let Hezekiah make you trust in Yahweh by saying, Yahweh will surely deliver us and this city will not be given into the hand of the king of Assyria. Do not listen to Hezekiah, for thus says the king of Assyria, make your peace with me and come out to me. Then each one of you will eat of his own vine and each one of his own fig tree and each one of you will drink the water of his own cistern until I come and take you away to a land like your own land, a land of grain and wine, a land of bread and vineyards, a land of olive trees and honey that you may live and not die. And do not listen to Hezekiah when he misleads you by saying, Yahweh will deliver us. 
Has any of the gods of the nations ever delivered his land out of the hand of the king of Assyria? Where are the gods of Hamath and Arpad? Where are the gods of Sepharvaim, Hina, and Iva? Have they delivered Samaria out of my hand? Who among all the gods of the lands have delivered their lands out of my hand that Yahweh should deliver Jerusalem out of my hand? But the people were silent and answered him not a word, for the king's command was, do not answer him. Then Eliakim, the son of Hilkiah, who was over the household, and Shebna, the secretary, and Joah, the son of Asaph, the recorder, came to Hezekiah with their clothes torn and told him the words of the Rabshakeh. Now, the Assyrians know how to trash talk. I mean, really and truly. That's a remarkable, remarkable exchange. There are several pieces and, 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 and questions uh, in this, and, and there's one uh, question of harmonization that I want to just mention for those of you who are going to go home and study the parallel accounts in Second Chronicles. There is some question whether the invasion that is referred to in verse 13 when the Assyrians come up against Jerusalem, and you realize you've got two different Assyrian incursions discussed in the verses we just read. We'll break that down in just a minute. But the first time that they come up against Jerusalem, Hezekiah pays them off. He gives them his gold out of the treasuries. He gives them the gold out of the treasuries of the Lord's house. He strips the gold off the doors of the temple that he had put there during the restoration efforts. So he pays them off. Doesn't work. Doesn't accomplish anything, as we see just immediately after. But there's a question whether that invasion in verse 13 is the same invasion that is described in 2 Chronicles 32, 1 through 19. I'm not inclined to think it is but it's at least possible that it is. And that's one of the things to bear in mind, that you have multiple episodes between Hezekiah and the Assyrians and between the Assyrian army and Jerusalem. Another thing to recognize is that this appears to be the same time, in fact, just shortly after, probably, we'll come to that later tonight, uh, the same time that Hezekiah nearly dies. When Isaiah comes to him and says, that's it, get your house in order, you're going to die. And Hezekiah turns to the wall and prays, and his life is extended. That's happening during this period. Now, you may say, but, but, but it doesn't happen for a couple of chapters in Kings. Right, but Kings is going to tell you at that time, and there are going to be some contextual clues that it's at this time that this is actually going on. So I want you to realize, as you're coming into this material with regard to Assyria, this is a disaster. This is a nightmare. You think about a perfect storm times two right? That the Assyrians have just destroyed the northern kingdom. They are wreaking havoc on the entire ancient Near East. They appear to be unstoppable. Hezekiah has rebelled against them in obedience to the Lord, out of trust for the Lord, and now their army shows up at Jerusalem. Hezekiah nearly dies, is spared only by the grace and mercy of God, has to, to strip all of the gold off the temple and, and empty his treasuries and pay them off and it accomplishes nothing. And they send representatives talking this way and trying to create civil war. You realize that's what they're trying to do. They are trying to create a scenario. Remember that recently there were two assassinations in the southern kingdom? We talked about this. If the people sitting on the wall, listening to the Assyrians, knowing what the Assyrians have been doing everywhere else, knowing that Hezekiah is weak, I mean, he just nearly died. We don't even know if he's going to be around. And he's about to get us destroyed because he's rebelling against the Assyrians. Doesn't he realize the Assyrians are trying to make peace with us? They don't want to kill all of us. They just want to subdue us. And we need to just go along with that. And if enough of them begin to think that way, maybe there's another coup and Hezekiah is killed. I mean, this is, a, this is a disaster. This whole scenario is absolutely a nightmare. And yet, God is faithful. And that's what you need to see coming out of this. God's faithfulness. There is no way Hezekiah should have survived this. There is no way that Judah should have survived this. This is one of those scenarios where you just, I mean, you're dead to rights and, and there's nothing, nothing that you can do. And yet, God preserves Hezekiah and the people, and he does not allow the Assyrians to prevail. When Sennacherib comes against Judah, Hezekiah seeks peace by placating them with money. This is what the Assyrians want. I mean, you know, pay us off, pay us protection money, and we'll leave you alone, except that's not how that works. 
right? You, you pay them the money, and then they send representatives and the commander of the army uh, in order to threaten you, uh, uh, further, uh, threaten further military action. Now, every time we've seen this, and we've seen this a few times already in the uh, history of the southern kingdom, every time we've seen this, we've said, this appears to be a lack of trust in God. This appears to be sin, right? Uh, if, if you're trusting God, you're not stripping gold off the doors of the temple. You're not emptying, emptying the treasury of the Lord in order to pay off a pagan king. It's a, it's a lack of trust. Now, the broader narrative and the summary that we've already seen seems to indicate that Hezekiah does trust the Lord. So what's going on here? Well, there's a couple of things you could say. One, you could say it's possible that Hezekiah is simply trying to make a wise decision uh, he's, he's simply trying to offer the tribute money that will preserve the nation. He's not doing it out of a lack of faith, but he's ra rather just making a political and economic call that doesn't, in the end, work, right? That's one possibility. I think the other possibility, and arguably the more likely possibility, is that this is a lapse in judgment and a lapse in faith. That it's not as though Hezekiah has become an unbeliever. It's not that he doesn't trust Yahweh, but he doesn't act like a believer here. And isn't that our experience so much of the time? It's not that when I sin, I suddenly decide, you know something? I don't believe that Jesus died and rose again after all. No, I, I always believe that Jesus died and rose again. Every day, every minute of every day. There's, I, I don't remember a time in my life that I have not been absolutely convinced of that. You'd have an easier time convincing me that my wife is not real than convincing me that Jesus is not crucified and resurrected. And yet, do I act like I believe that every day? No, and neither do you. We make decisions all the time that are a manifestation of unbelief. And I tend to think that's what's going on here. Now, regardless of how you understand this decision by Hezekiah, it doesn't work. It doesn't create a lasting peace. They bought time for themselves, but they could not bring about true peace in this fashion. And so the Assyrians send the Tartan, the Rabsaris, and the Rabshakeh. These are all Assyrian titles, not personal names. The Tartan would likely, almost certainly, be the commander of the army. The Rabsaris means the chief of the eunuchs, but he's thought to be a, a, a chief of the bodyguard or some kind of official. And then the Rabshakeh, who appears to be the primary spokesman in all of these exchanges, uh, his, his title actually means that he's like the chief officer or cupbearer but he'd be somebody in close proximity to the king. And so what you see in the rest of this chapter are negotiations between two kingdoms, right, representatively. The king of Assyria is not there. Hezekiah is not there. He sends out Eliakim and Shebna and Joah, and, and these, these three representatives for each of the kingdoms are parlaying. And very clearly what you see in the exchange is that the Assyrians are arrogant and presumptuous. They do not understand the nature of Hezekiah's reforms. They seek to intimidate both the Judean officials and the common people who are overhearing their exchange. They even represent themselves as acting on behalf of God. That's a really remarkable thing. I would like to actually kind of take this whole chapter apart. That would defeat the purpose of trying to plow through the whole thing tonight. But, but I would encourage you to go back through and look carefully at what they say. Uh, they say... I, it's, it's really a brilliant piece of rhetoric. It really is. It's wrong in every kind of way. It's wicked, it's blasphemous, it's disrespectful. You notice they refer to the king of Assyria every time they refer to him as the great king, right? which would be kind of an official way of referring to him. They never refer to Hezekiah as king. They always just refer to him as Hezekiah. right? I mean, you imagine... Uh, you know, that, that the, uh, the, the leader of Iran sending representatives to the United States and referring to, don't let Donald deceive you, right? I mean, you would know that's meant as a slur. That's meant as a slap, right? Uh, uh, our, our great ruler, our great ruler will make peace with you, but don't let Donald deceive you. You know, that's, that's essentially what they're doing. And they're saying, if, if, if Hezekiah tells you, no, no, we're trusting in Yahweh. We're not trusting in Egypt. We're trusting in Yahweh. Hey, hasn't Hezekiah been making war on Yahweh? Now, there's some question among the commentators. Uh, are they being, do they actually misunderstand Hezekiah's reforms, or are they being disingenuous? I think they misunderstand it. But, but regardless, it's brilliant either way. They know enough about what is going on inside Judah to know that Hezekiah has been conducting religious reforms, taking away the high places, removing these other shrines, telling people they can only worship at Jerusalem, and they use that as leverage 
And then Hezekiah's representatives maybe make kind of a foolish mistake in saying, would you, would you please talk to us in Aramaic? We can understand that. Don't talk to us in the Judean dialect because everybody's listening. And the Assyrians are like, of course they're listening, and we're here to speak to them. And of course they are. And, uh, and, and again, trying to create civil unrest and an uprising. And then when they say, we've come because Yahweh sent us. I mean, this is just flat-out blasphemy. Now, the Bible's very clear. God raised up the Assyrian Empire to judge the northern kingdom of Israel. Isaiah says that the Assyrians are the axe in God's hand in Isaiah 10 and 11. But he did not empower Assyria to judge Judah. They do not have that warrant. And I don't believe, by the way, that the Assyrians even have an, uh, any true understanding of their role in judging other nations in the ancient Near East. But, but they were appealing even to Yahweh in an attempt to drive a wedge between the leadership in Judah and the common people. What do we need to see here by way of application? Two points very quickly. First, faithfulness does not preclude or prevent great danger and disaster. If Hezekiah has faithfully served God, why are these troubles overwhelming him? Why is Judah in such great danger when they finally have a righteous king? Right? What is God doing? Couldn't God prevent this? Of course he could. Did he? No. And you have to remember there is an adversary. In fact, Judah's greatest hour of danger came upon them, not during their disobedience, but during a season of repentance, reformation, and revival. Except for the destruction of Judah, I don't think you can argue that there is a more uh, a greater crisis in the history of the southern kingdom than this moment, right? Um, in Mark chapter 4, when Jesus tells the parable of the sower, and he gives the interpretation in the house to the disciples, he describes the seed sown on, on the wayside, on the path, in this way. He says, when they hear, Satan immediately comes. When you hear the word of God, then cometh the devil, as the King James says. Do not be surprised when obedience and seriousness about the things of God is immediately followed by some of the greatest trials you've ever encountered. They will not come during your seasons of disobedience. They will come during the time when you're actually trying to do what's right. And you're like, okay, all right, fine. We're going we're gonna to do this right. We're going to repent. We're going to get our family turned in the direction of the Lord. And then it's like, I mean, it's, it's bad. It's bad. It's like all the demons of hell come out of the woodwork. But you're not alone. Don't be caught off guard when that happens. Secondly, the boastful words of the wicked have no power in the courts of heaven. I wish I could say they have no power on earth. You know that's not true. But they have no power in the courts of heaven. God answers the Assyrians' threats in the next chapter. But the fact that the wicked say they are acting on behalf of God doesn't mean anything. Their threats have no true power. They may deceive and disturb others with lies and threats, but God will not honor their arrogance. We have to learn to live with confidence in God's word and not be unduly frightened by the empty boasts and threats of wicked men. You do not fear them because they have no power in heaven. Chapter 19. As soon as King Hezekiah heard it, he tore his clothes and covered himself with sackcloth and went into the house of Yahweh. And he sent Eliakim, who was over the household, and Shebna the secretary, and the senior priest, covered with sackcloth, to Isaiah the son of Amos. They said to him, Thus says Hezekiah, This day is a day of distress, of rebuke, and of disgrace. Children have come to the point of birth, and there is no strength to bring them forth. It may be that Yahweh your God heard all the words of the Rabshakeh, whom his master, the king of Assyria, has sent to mock the living God and will rebuke the words that Yahweh your God has heard. Therefore, lift up your prayer for the remnant that is left. When the servants of King Hezekiah came to Isaiah, Isaiah said to them, Say to your master, Thus says Yahweh, Do not be afraid because of the words that you have heard, with which the servants of the king of Assyria have reviled me. Behold, I will put a spirit in him so that he shall hear a rumor and return to his own land, and I will make him fall by the sword in his own land. Put a pin there. That's going to get fulfilled, right? Verse 8. The Rabshakeh returned and found the king of Assyria fighting against Libna, for he heard that the king had left Lachish. Now the king heard concerning Tirhaka, king of Cush. Behold, he has set out to fight against you. 
So he sent messengers again to Hezekiah, saying, Thus you shall speak to Hezekiah, king of Judah. Do not let your God, in whom you trust, deceive you by promising that Jerusalem will not be given into the hand of the king of Assyria. Behold, you have heard what the kings of Assyria have done to all lands, devoting them to destruction. And shall you be delivered? Have the gods of the nations delivered them, the nations that my fathers destroyed, Gozan, Haran, Rezeph, and the people of Eden who are in Telassar? Where is the king of Hamath, the king of Arpad, the king of the city of Sepharvaim, the king of Hena, and the king of Iva? Hezekiah received the letter from the hand of the messengers and read it. And Hezekiah went up to the house of Yahweh and spread it before Yahweh. And Hezekiah prayed before Yahweh and said, O Yahweh, God of Israel, enthroned above the cherubim, you are God. You alone of all the kingdoms of the earth, you have made heaven and earth. Incline your ear, O Yahweh, and hear. Open your eyes, O Yahweh, and see. And hear the words of Sennacherib, which he has sent to mock the living God. Truly, O Yahweh, the kings of Assyria have laid waste the nations and their lands and have cast their gods into the fire, for they were not gods, but the work of men's hands, wood and stone. Therefore, they were destroyed. So now, O Yahweh, our God, save us, please, from his hand, that all the kingdoms of the earth may know that you, O Yahweh, are God alone. Then Isaiah, the son of Amos, sent to Hezekiah, saying, Thus says Yahweh, the God of Israel, Your prayer to me about Sennacherib, king of Assyria, I have heard. This is the word that Yahweh has spoken concerning him. She despises you. She scorns you, the virgin daughter of Zion. She wags her head behind you, the daughter of Jerusalem. Whom have you mocked and reviled? Against whom have you raised your voice and lifted your eyes to the heights? Against the Holy One of Israel. By your messengers you have mocked the Lord and have said, With my many chariots I have gone up to the high gone up the heights of the mountains to the far recesses of Lebanon. I felled its tallest cedars, its choicest cypresses. I entered its farthest lodging place, its most fruitful forest. I dug wells and drank foreign waters, and I dried up with the sole of my foot all the streams of Egypt. Have you not heard that I determined it long ago? I planned it from days of old. What now I bring to pass, that you should turn fortified cities into heaps of ruins, while their inhabitants, shorn of strength, are dismayed and confounded, and have become like plants of the field and like tender grass, like grass on the housetops, blighted before it is grown. But I know you're sitting down, and you're going out and coming in, and you're raging against me. Because you have raged against me, and your complacency has come into my ears, I will put my hook in your nose, and my bit in your mouth, and I will turn you back on the way by which you came. And this shall be the sign for you. This year, eat what grows of itself, and in the second year, what springs of the same. Then in the third year, sow and reap and plant vineyards and eat their fruit. And the surviving remnant of the house of Judah shall again take root downward and bear fruit upward. For out of Jerusalem shall go a remnant, and out of Mount Zion a band of survivors. The zeal of Yahweh will do this. Therefore, thus says Yahweh concerning the king of Assyria, He shall not come into this city, or shoot an arrow there, or come before it with a shield, or cast up a siege mound against it. By the way that he came, by the same he shall return. And he shall not come into this city, declares Yahweh. For I will defend this city to save it for my own sake, and for the sake of my servant David. And that night, the angel of Yahweh went out and struck down 185,000 of the camp of the Assyrians. And when people arose early in the morning, behold, these were all dead bodies. Then Sennacherib, king of Assyria, departed and went home and lived at Nineveh. And as he was worshiping in the house of Nisroch his god, Adramelech and Sherezer his son struck him down with the sword and escaped into the land of Ararat. And Esarhaddon his son reigned in his place. He struck down 20 years after this campaign, after he goes back. We have extensive... Uh, uh, information about this period, by the way, from the Assyrians themselves, the Assyrian Chronicles. They don't record the death of the 185,000, curiously. They only mention the victories and the successes, but they also don't explain why Assyria never goes to Jerusalem and attacks it, and why, uh, as they're having so much success, they suddenly pack up and go home and, uh, um, you know, kind of decline from that point. It's because God struck down a huge number of their army, not at Jerusalem. They never made it that far. They never got to Jerusalem. On a foreign battlefield, God sends plague into that camp. 
and the surviving soldiers wake up the next morning and they are surrounded by corpses. Time to go home. (laughs) We don't know what's happening, but time to go home. Hezekiah was greatly disturbed at the beginning of this chapter, understandably so. Faith will not make us emotionless robots. It should not make us careless regarding true dangers. The first thing that Hezekiah does, did you notice, is he goes to worship and pray in the temple. The first thing, verse 1, covered himself with sackcloth and went into the house of Yahweh. Then he sends messengers to Isaiah to ask for prayer. But the first thing he does is he goes to worship. Remember that on the day that disaster is looming and you don't feel like going to worship, you don't feel like gathering with the saints, you don't feel like being in the house of the Lord, you know where you need to be that day of all days? In the house of the Lord with the people of God. He sends messengers to Isaiah to receive the word from the Lord and Isaiah reassures the men that they need not fear the king of Assyria and that Yahweh will deliver them. Now you notice there are four sections to this, maybe five I guess depending on how you count it, but but at least four uh, interchanges in this chapter that we just read. First, Hezekiah sends word to Isaiah and Isaiah gives this word of encouragement and reassurance. And then the Assyrians come back with a letter and they further threaten and, and frighten And then Hezekiah takes that letter to the Lord and spreads it out before the Lord in praise. And then Isaiah brings back another word from God. So those four stages of of, uh, exchange. Now perhaps Satan desired to counteract the comfort and the encouragement that the prophet had given to Hezekiah. What prompts the Assyrian king to send this letter? He's just finished at Lachish. He's gone on to Libna. He's just found out that the king of Cush is about to bring the North Africans and Egyptians up. So he's fighting battles on multiple fronts. And what does he realize? Well, he realizes strategically, I can only fight so many battles on so many fronts, right? If I can send a letter to Jerusalem and I can convince them to surrender without having to take my army there, so much the better. And that's the purpose of this letter. But in Satan's plan, don't you imagine that this letter comes along when it does because Isaiah showed up with an encouraging word? Don't be surprised when God sends you encouragement and right on the heels of that encouragement is further reasons for fear and discouragement. And so Hezekiah receives this letter and it mocks Yahweh. It just says, don't imagine your God is going to succeed where every other God has failed. I've mowed down every nation I've come to. Where are their gods? Where are their kings? You're about to be in the same place. And what does Hezekiah do? He goes into the house of God and he spreads it out before the Lord. And he says essentially, look at this. Listen to what Sennacherib has said about you. We know that you are the true God. So please save us. This, by the way, is one of my favorite prayers in the whole Bible. Certainly one of the greatest examples of prayer in the Old Testament. He says, of course, Lord, the Assyrians destroyed all the other nations because their gods are not gods. But you are the true God. And Yahweh sends word to Hezekiah by Isaiah again, assuring him of his presence, his power, and his purpose. If you're taking notes, verses 20 to 28 of Isaiah's response are Yahweh's words against Assyria. And verses 29 to 34 are his words addressing Judah. And then, the end of the chapter, God deals with Assyria. He didn't kill the whole army. Oh, no, no. That would not be sufficiently frightening. He kills 185,000 soldiers in that massive army so that everybody wakes up next to a corpse. And who is it that does this? The angel of Yahweh. Now, if you remember, we've talked about the angel of Yahweh quite a few times. I had a sermon about this not too long ago. I don't want to be dogmatic about this, but it seems to me that every time we meet the angel of Yahweh in the Old Testament, we're meeting a pre-incarnate appearance of the Son of God. This is the warrior king. In Revelation 19, who comes riding on a white horse and feeds the army of the enemy to the birds. And so Sennacherib uh, gathers his army up, returns to Nineveh, and many years later is assassinated by two of his sons while worshiping his own God. Yahweh will not be mocked. Now, we sang Psalm 28, and you may have noticed that a portion of that psalm is imprecation, right? And it's just, I'm sure some of you just get very nervous and agitated and frustrated when whenever pastor has a saying you know curses against God's enemies but you realize this chapter is a picture it's a historical picture of imprecation being offered and fulfilled what does Hezekiah do he prays imprecatory prayers and what does God do 
he shows up and he takes care of his people by bringing judgment upon their enemies. How do we handle danger and disaster? Well, we handle it the way that Hezekiah handled it. We worship, we pray, and we trust God. We must bring our fears and needs to God and lay them out before Him and then have faith to leave them there. This is my problem. I bring my fears to the Lord, I spread it out, I say, Lord, look at this, do something about this. Now I'll take that with me and uh, try to fix it on my own. That's not what Hezekiah does. Admittedly, he's in a position where he can't really do that because, I mean, what are you going to do, right? The Assyrians are going to just mow you down. He's desperate. But you, you and I must learn to trust God to deliver us. It may be frightening. There's no promise that it won't be. There is no promise that it, well, if you serve God, then you will never encounter something that makes you afraid. No. It may be frightening. It may take a long time. But trust him because he cares for you. Dale Ralph Davis, in his commentary on this passage, said this, quote, Prayer is frequently unnerving because it is the activity we engage in between catastrophe and deliverance. But if we pray truth, as Hezekiah did, we will find it not only reaches God, but anchors us. That's as much time as I've got tonight. So I've got another chapter, and I've got a lot more material. So that's a good stopping point. We're at the top of the hour, so I'm going to just pause there, and we'll pick up in chapter 20 next week. Questions?